Okay. Welcome everyone um, to those joining and those who've been patiently waiting. Uh, my name is Andy McEwen. I'm uh, the Deputy Director of Medical Education. I work up at the Crew Campus and I know you've met several members of the senior leadership team already, including our Dean, um, but uh, I, I'm one of the uh, senior academics that that helps to to run the academic side of Cree Campus, and that's what we're trying to con concentrate on today. And I'm sure this has already been said to you, but we're we're so uh, so disappointed that we haven't been able to show you the campus today. But there will be lots and lots of opportunities to do, do that in future uh, when perhaps the uh, the weather has been kinder to us. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, but mainly at the Crew Campus. Uh, so hopefully I can shift that on. There we are. So, so I must say some of you who have already been in the, um, the other meetings with uh, Professor Harris uh, will have seen a lot of this, but I don't intend to go over everything again, but it bears repeating if you weren't in the meeting as well. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about. So we have two campuses, but it's really, really important to emphasize for medicine we are one medical school across two sites and uh, it very much feels that way everything we do is replicated wherever you are Buckingham or crew so so a lot of what I'm going to say today wouldn't matter if you had been sitting in 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 an open day that was about both campuses but we're going to try and concentrate a little bit more on, on crew and and its nuances um, but Do I'm sure Prof Harris has, has said a lot about this about how we work the the, the, the lack of cap on international student numbers, making it a lot easier for our international colleagues to join us. Uh, and that now we run our interview processes all remotely online and very successfully, Touchwood, uh, uh, very, uh, normally, that, which means that uh, people, people don't necessarily have to do such an arduous journey to get to us. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't welcome you on campus if, we, if you're coming for a tour. We have a lot of experience what we do now we're, we're we the, the campus itself might be in its infancy but the medical school's now been running since 2012 uh, 2014 sorry uh, and we have a lot of experience in supporting uh, both uk and international students so uh, these are the maps of the two campuses well, they're different in different ways and it's probably worth me me saying a little bit about what i think the difference is so buckingham is a small town um, and the uh, university campus is a very uh, picturesque campus, uh, tucked away in the, in sort of the, the centre, just behind the, the town centre. Crew is very much more uh, based around industry. Uh, it's a railway town, uh, and and that has its strengths really because it's very very accessible. Uh, and so you know some people will say get on a train at Crew, you can go anywhere in the UK. Uh, and so so. The, the, the sort of small town feel of Buckingham uh, is a trade off, I suppose, against the accessibility of crew uh, and, and, and it's sort of perhaps larger feel in that regard. So if I haven't emphasized the point enough, uh, the experience that you have at each site in terms of curriculum, in terms of student support, in terms of assessment is all replicated and mirrored. So we are one curriculum, the teaching is joint, it's done by the same lecturers, same staff, uh, and, 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 and really is uh, identical uh, in as many ways as it possibly can. But I suppose the dif difference is the facilitation. So um, you will, and I hope um, Prince and maybe some of the other students are on, on this call, um, will be able to tell you about the clinical educators who facilitate our teaching. Uh, now they are a local, facilitators um, and um, very much are there day to day uh, and, and, and supplement what the lecturers are doing. And of course, well, we don't get you to go to the crew campus and then send you all the way down to Buckingham for all of your uh, clinical experiences. Uh, we do have local clinical partners that I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, where we send our students very early on in the course and then later more intensively for phase two. So these are some pictures of the of the campus itself and <clears throat> excuse me two of the buildings that we use an awful lot at the bottom there's the sports uh, sports and exercise uh, uh, center where some of the biomedical science teaching happens where our podiatry clinic is being built for allied health uh, and the top uh, picture is actually a francis wood building which is the medical school building uh, for most of the teaching that you would have 
Uh, the, the campus itself is dedicated to allied health. So it's, it's a slightly different experience than my, what you might get at Buckingham. Buckingham obviously has other courses running. All of the courses running up at the Creek campus in some way relate to health uh, and health professions. Uh, so the, the campus has been running now since 2019. Medicine has been running there since 2021. Um, and again, we try and mirror as many of the facilities on site as, as you would get uh, down south. So we had a very large student union building. Uh, I'm going to boast and say it is larger than the student union build building in Buckingham. Uh, there's a gym on site. Uh, there's student union offices on site, uh, and and so we, we 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 try and mirror everything that we can do. Sports and exercise centre as well for uh, and, and a 4G uh, astroturf pitch as well. So I've already said a little bit about the town. Uh, it's a it's a funny it's a funny place, crew, because it's it's a it's a bit of an in out town. Um, it is quite industrial uh, in in its centre, and then maybe. You know, five miles out, you're getting into the really leafy uh, areas of Cheshire uh, and and quite affluent areas. So not only if you were coming to to sort of practice medicine up here, would you see really interesting pathology because of that kind of contrast, uh, the affluent and and perhaps the not so, but also it means you've got fantastic places to go and explore. Uh, I actually live very close to to Liverpool, so I'm testament how easy it is to to travel between uh, between Liverpool, Manchester, to get to Crew, and really easy rail links for all of those things. But not just for Liverpool, and Manchester. It's very easy to get to Birmingham. It's about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and forty uh, uh, down to uh, to the, the Milton Keynes uh, railway station, which is the closest one uh, to to the Buckingham site. And then probably about just under two hours to get to London on a direct train. So. Um, these things are likely to get quicker and quicker as well with the development of the high-speed rail that's going to connect at Crewe. Uh, so it is a very, very accessible place. I said I'd mention a little bit more about our, our, our clinical partners. Certainly when I was at your stage and I was considering whether I wanted to do medicine, uh, I, I very much was keen to know what the bread and butter curriculum would look like, but I also wanted to know when would I be you know, sitting in a GP practice, when would I be uh, in a hospital? Uh, and, and if we haven't emphasized this this morning, we do that very, very early on in the course. So uh, there is immediate uh, graded exposure to patients in, in the first term, uh, but also our clinical skills foundation course uh, is very much embedded in general practice in hospitals uh, at where you're meeting patients, you're taking histories and ex you're examining and, and you do that you know, from, from, from almost day one. So our two partners, uh, trusts that we use for secondary care are uh, Macclesfield General Hospital, which is about 40 minutes uh, travel journey from, from the campus itself. Um, and then Leighton Hospital, which is very much closer, about five miles away from, from the campus. Both are easily reachable with by train, uh, or well, not you don't need a train to go to Leighton, but by bus for both of them, and a train for Macclesfield, should you wish. Um, there are other areas that you will visit for mental health, for community services throughout the course, and for primary care. And, and we don't legislate about exactly where they are. It depends on uh, it depends on your circumstances and, and our circumstances we develop. Um, but they are they're all relatively local services. Okay, and I'm sure Prof Paris has gone through some of this, but this definitely bears repeating. This is why we're different. So we are a four and a half year course rather than the you know, more, more classic five year or six year courses that you would get as an undergrad in, in medicine in the UK. Um, and, and that goes with the ethos of accelerated programmes that the Vice Chancellor will have talked to you about. But we're also GMC accredited. Now, what does that mean? It may or may not mean very much to you at this stage, but it means that once you've graduated with a MBCHB from us, you are entitled to apply for foundation training and all the sort of uh, riches that come with that. Uh, lots of people ask us, and they may have asked already, you know, is it a guaranteed job? No, there are no guaranteed jobs in the UK. If you went to a different university, you'd get exactly the same uh, experience. But um, th there hasn't been a year uh, for the last sort of 10 at least 
where um, foundation training jobs haven't been found for every graduate that has wanted one um, from 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 all universities. And 99 point you know, something percent of our graduates all go into foundation training. Those that haven't have decided to go back to the countries of origin uh, and practice there. And I'm sure Joe has talked to you a little bit more about our educational uh, models, you know, much, much, very much embedded in, in small group work, uh, in that feeling that we have open door policies to, to access to our lecturers, to our clinical educators, and we try and innovate where possible and use, uh, you know, AV uh, and technological advances for things like uh, anatomy. Uh, and we use streaming now as well, you know, which is obviously a lot more commonplace, uh, uh, you know, in, in all medical schools and all universities to deliver uh, some of the more effective uh, teaching when we don't think that it should be face to face. But it's now a kind of hybrid model and hopefully touch wood as we get back to whatever normal looks like in the pandemic that will start to, to really be uh, a rich educational uh, context. So again, I won't dwell on this too much. Um, this is the curriculum split into two phases. Phase one, uh, more concentrating on the biomedical science, the, the, the sort of scientific underpinning of what we do in, in, in our clinical work, but very much led um, with a thread of how that applies to patients and clinical work. So there's everything comes back to patients that we do. Uh, so although they will, you know, we have topics like molecules, genes and diseases, it's very much based on clinical cases uh, and the group work that's based, uh, that's facilitated on that. You can see the two uh, courses in grey, the clinical skills foundation course and narrative medicine. They're your face to face opportunities to meet patients uh, and they are uh, weekly in clinical foundation course all the way through phase one and for narrative medicine sporadically through uh, the, the course and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that when, when we're open to questions. Phase two uh, is split up into two rotations, uh, junior rotations a year, senior rotations slightly longer than that as you do your electives and apprenticeships. Um, but the junior and senior rotations are fully embedded within our partners. So uh, Macclesfield, Leighton, primary care, uh, surrounding GP practices. Um, and, and so it's very much uh, five days a week within the clinical setting. So I've discussed this a little bit already. Uh, all our learning is integrated and, uh, and, and very much focuses on the clinical at all times because that, that's what we need to do is apply our biomedical science learning uh, to what we're doing in the clinic. Uh, a little bit about accommodation, which I know uh, we will have talked about this morning, but uh, Booth Hall is, I think, a real selling point if I were... Uh, an undergraduate student again. Um, I won't bother telling you how long I used to have to trek to get to my lectures when I was a, when I was a lad, um, but uh, the Booth Hall accommodation is generously, I'd say, five minutes walk from the campus. It's, it's, it's literally opposite uh, the campus itself. You, you know, walking over the main road probably is the time, you know, time it takes to, to wait for the, uh, the lights to change and things like that, that makes it five minutes. So I have been told by some of the uh, students that uh, if you have to do it quicker than five minutes, it's very possible if you need to get to lectures on time. Uh, it, it has communal areas, but all of the uh, rooms are en suite uh, and individual, but there are then communal lounges. Downstairs, there is uh, sofas, lounge space, pool tables, uh, computer areas. Uh, and accommodation is guaranteed to all first year students, but as far as I'm aware, it is guaranteed to second year students at the moment. Um, but I will double check that, but I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that's what we've guaranteed so far. Just a little bit more there to, to tell you, I'm sure Joe sh showed you this already, but that's a sort of typical room uh, in Booth Hall. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, the beauty is certainly that we have capacity at the moment. It's a very, very large site. And as medicine's getting off the ground, uh, we have uh, lots of capacity for rooms at, at Booth Hall. So I've already said that we're uh, GMC accredited, we're internationally recognized. Lots of our um, uh, students and graduates go off to other uh, countries to practice and the MBCHB is very well recognized across the globe. 
Uh, we're in that world directory of medical schools. Uh, so it does, does make getting a job a little bit easier internationally. Um, I, it's worth saying at the moment, and I'm sure uh, Prof Harris has already said this, but there is a medical licensing exam coming in that you as uh, you, people who might start in 2023 will, will sit uh, probably in the final year of your studies, uh, and that will be uh, necessary to pass in order to get a license to practice in the UK. Um, so it's slightly separate to our degree, it's all a little bit uh, technical, um, but in order to then go in and be a foundation doctor, you would need to pass that exam. So we, we, we will obviously, we feel that we will really well equip you for that. Uh, no one has taken the assessment yet, um, but but we, we feel that there will be really well, uh, well versed to do that because it, it mirrors a lot of what we do in final year anyway. Okay. I'm sure Joe has shown these already, um, but I think it's worth reflecting on some of the feedback that we've had, uh, and certainly not just from our students, um, but from the General Medical Council, our regulator. So students are well supported. Uh, the quality of what we do uh, is well regulated. Um, and we have systems in place to make sure that students who work hard who are engaged do well. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Katia Mann, um, because this, this session was not just about medicine, but uh, about our pre-med courses, which sort of go hand in hand for a lot of people. And uh, some people will find that actually both courses are relevant to, to what they do. So I, I just want to hand over to Katia uh, for a moment to tell you a little bit about the pre-med course. Katia. Thank you very much. So um, those of you who study, who want to study medicine, of course, you will not want to see us, but if you do not quite make it to medical school yet, but you're not very far off, what we offer is a, we call it a one-year pre-med, but as you can see from the dates there, it's more like a 10-month pre-med. And this is designed to get you ready to entry uh, into Buckingham Medical School. So this is entirely, this course is entirely designed with medical school entry in mind. Um, you will not need my contact details at this point. Um, we are also based in Crew. We work together um, in Crew. We actually live in Booth Hall for part of the week, the lecturers, because um, as we've just heard how, how accessible crew is, I'm actually commuting from London two or three times a week uh, and, and stay in Booth Hall, same as the students. So this pre-med is really designed for those who have been turned down by medicine. If that happens, you will be put in contact with us. So you'll get all the uh, details, how to apply to us and, um, we will see you then. So the courses, we, the modules we teach in this course are um, split into roughly three areas. Professional values and behaviors is one area. One area is basic sciences where you can see the four MCB and four MEM modules here. These are really a catch up on uh, basic biology, chemistry and physics as you will need in um, your medical degree. And then there are the slightly more clinical, more integrated subjects that are often taught as PBLs. They are systems-based and there are four BMC, GHM and CFB. So they're systems-based on brain and muscle, on um, guts, hormones and uh, metabolism, and, and one of them on cardiovascular and respiratory science. Um, as you can see, the systems-based modules are taught in, as problem-based learnings, but also lectures and tutorials. And the other uh, subjects are largely teach, uh, taught in um, lectures and tutorials. The whole thing takes about 10 months. Um, you will, at the end of this course, sit a synoptic exam. And if you pass the synoptic exam plus Buckingham's MMI, we wave you off happily to medical school if you pass it with more than 70%. This is a tall order, it's difficult, but slightly over half of our uh, pre-meds do do that every year. If you do not do that, not all is lost. You can then go on to the second year of the biomedical sciences, BSc, and either become a scientist or 
try again as a graduate entry to medical school. If you want to hear more about that, there is a session at two o'clock this afternoon where I'm talking about the biomedical sciences BSc. But this part of the course is entirely designed to basically send you off to medical school after less than a year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katia. And certainly happy to go back to some questions about any of that um, if we need to. Um, so uh, hopefully this has also been shared with you this morning, um, but uh, we appreciate you're not on campus today. So uh, if you share if, on your phone to the QR code uh, that's in the bottom right uh, of this slide, uh, you have access to uh, more of the uh, kind of experiential side of of being on campus, our campus tours, uh, our, uh, what the students think, uh, and, and a little bit more about our courses. So there is a little bit more in depth uh, on that QR code should you wish to look at it. So that leaves us with time for questions, I think. So uh, those are how to, those are the ways of, try, of, of finding us on various social media platforms. Uh, and we do always welcome a, a follow uh, and a, a question uh, on those platforms as well uh, as uh, the medicine admissions uh, email that's at the top there, which is obviously crucial. And I'm sure uh, lots of you are beavering away already uh, speaking to our team there. So I hope that Dr. Selway is now going to help uh, triage some of your questions and put them into some form of meaningful order, I'm sure, uh, uh, so we can we can. Uh, talk more. So I'm going to come off slide share, I think, so everybody can be seen. He Absolutely. Says. So I've got a variety of questions already in the chat. And if you do have any more, please do put them into the Q&A box. Um, we'll be able to answer those questions for you. We've got a range of different people on our panel. So you've already met Andy and Katia. Um, but we've also got our admissions team in the background and some student ambassadors. I've seen Prince. Is there anybody else? on the uh hi friends um is there anybody else on the call i think that might be it that's three buckingham people okay um so we've got students here as well so please do direct questions directly to our students um who give a very different viewpoint um but hopefully consistent with what we've been telling you already so the first question that came in is about um is there any support for students who want to graduate and then go to the us um for example with usmle and writing references etc andy i think the, the short answer is yes we we welcome that it's not structured within the course per se but again that would be normal in in uk medical schools but we're very versed in Canadian exams, uh, American, uh, you know, USMLE exams, our phase two support network and our phase two lead uh, are very happy to help with that sort of thing, certainly in terms of uh, writing references, but also uh, some of the steering toward the academic side. What I would say, and I can see Dr. Selway has got the glint in her eye, what feedback we've had from students who have taken those exams before is that the, the phase one uh, teaching that, that happens is very, very much aligned to the sorts of questions and the content that you would have to, uh, to revise for those kinds of exams. And so uh, I'm, I promise I'm not just saying this, uh, students often say, well, what I did was I went back to my phase one notes uh, to revise rather than having to learn things new. So I think we feel that you're well equipped uh, to do that sort of thing. And yes, we, we, we see it as something that we can support you on. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go down the list because they are all quite different. Um, so Prince, maybe you could start with this and maybe Andy could follow up when we're thinking about clinical years. So how is the course delivered? And what's the balance between lecture time, your own time and clinical practice? Okay. Um... So I actually made a blog about, you know, the routine that we have in medical school. Um, so if anyone wants to look at that, they can just look at the blogs. But um, depending on the year that you're in and the day as well, you either have morning classes that run from nine to one with a two hour group work between, um, between those two lectures. So it's a lecture from nine to 10, two hours of group work. And then um, from 12 to one, you have a lecture again or it can be the afternoon lectures where it's one to two you have a lecture two hours of group work and then a final lecture 
And obviously after that, you have um, sample reaction studies. So another four hours. So after the lectures, you can just go ahead and study on your own. Um, obviously you're not forced to, but it is advised if you want to stay on top of your work. Um, in terms of uh, the clinical practice, so our first term was online. So unfortunately, we didn't get to have any clinical practice um, then, but we did have um, narrative medicine. So that's just a small module where, not small, it's actually quite large, um, where you, um, you're assigned a patient and um, with this patient, you follow up with them for around two years, so five terms, and you get to um, you get an insight on what it's like to live with a different kind of condition. So based on the patients who are assigned, um, you can get a, a varying conditions for the patient. And instead of just seeing the clinical aspect of, you know, um, what the pathologies uh, might be like, you also get to understand what it is like uh, living with, um, you know, a certain disease. And we also get um, placements. So on one disease, um, right now we have placements. Um, either in the university where we just get to learn how to take histories, but we also get to go to hospital and actually perform examinations and take histories from patients as well as GP where, you know, it's a different setting. So we actually get like a broad clinical experience of what it is like to um, be in different places. Thank you, Prince. Andy? Yeah, so when... Um reiterate what Prince has said about phase one because that, I think that was a really good summary and I would encourage you to look at his blogs which I think you can access via those, that QR code that I uh, put up um, but so that I'll talk about phase two a little bit because Prince is, a, is not at phase two yet um, so phase two um, is much much more clinical facing 100% clinical facing um, it, some people are actually often a little bit surprised at how much once you've finished phase two you really are embedded within uh the uh local education provider those partners that i mentioned uh before and you stay uh, for the vast majority of your time you stay within that trust so if you were at Leighton hospital you know you're probably going to do 90 85 90 percent of your 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 stuff your clinical work within that hospital and its surrounding areas now no hospital these days has everything on site, you know, in one place. That's just not the way the National Health Service works. So there is still travel to be had for various things, especially things like mental health uh, and general practice. But your nine to five, once you've done your first two years at our course, nine to five, Monday to Friday, we expect you to be in a clinical setting. Uh, so it is very different to phase one where you have much more structured uh, self-directed learning time, like Prince says, you know, you have four hours of teaching, four hours of self-directed learning. It's not that you don't ever have that in phase two, but it's perhaps a little bit more sporadic in terms of timetabling. We expect you to take more responsibility for your, for your own learning and, and to make sure you get to clinics. Okay, hopefully that's answered the question, but any follow-ups, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, so there's an uh, anonymous um, question here. Um, if I was to study medicine at Crewe, um, would I be at the same campus for both phase one and phase two? Would I need to move back to Buckingham for my clinical years? Could you clarify that, Andy? I, I think the easiest answer to say is, is no, we don't expect you to be moving. Um, we, we hope to accommodate everybody in the placements that, that we have in terms of capacity. As we build and we grow, uh, some, there might may be some opportunity for that to change. But at the moment, we have plenty of space in our local education providers, both at Buckingham and both at Crewe. Uh, so it may be that in years to come, that might change. But at the moment, no. If you're a Crewe student, you will have a Crewe experience. So who do you... Yeah, the other question, how do you decide who gets to go to the, the Crew campus or the Buckingham campus? So that's a good question, Joe. So um, what we do is we, um, it's, it's sort of first come first serve in terms of what you can, you know, if you, if you have a preference, but once one of the campuses is filled, so I think on my slide, I, I, you know, we have 180 places, uh, 120 at Buckingham, 60 at Crewe currently. Um, so for the sake of argument, if Crewe was filled up first and all 60 places were, were filled and you happen to uh, interview later in the year for us uh, or, or, you know, or for some reason your examination results are later, uh, it may be that the only the Buckingham campus is available for places. Um, so so uh, what we do at the end is we 
allocate you and give you an offer for one of the campuses. So I hope that's clear. If one of them fills up, uh, you know, as the year goes on, then we can only uh, offer the other campus. Uh, yeah, so it is a little it, bit first come first serve. It's it's worth saying that if you have a specific need to be on a specific campus, we definitely do take that into account. That so is very true. You know, do talk to us um, before yeah. the allocation process begins post offer. So don't worry, the admissions team will talk you through it. But it is really important if you have a specific need to talk to us very, very early because, you know, as Ali said, spaces fill up. So are, is teaching going to be on campus in 2023? Oh, crikey, there's a crystal ball. Goodness me, I hope so. Um, so Prince mentioned he was one of the inaugural, you know, Med 21 cohort, uh, and they had uh, their first term online. Uh, and that was purely because the UK was in total lockdown at that time. Uh, and therefore, um, we really had no choice but to, to do online learning. Since then, so I think Prince's cohort came back in very early May of 2021. Um, we Things have progressed slightly in the thinking, I think, of how important medical education, allied health education is to the NHS, and that we can't have students just continuing to learn online, even if there is another um, spike of, of cases, or even if there were a national lockdown. So um, I think I'm right in saying uh, I can't remember, Prince, if you if you were on campus when there was a national lockdown or not. But certainly in the early stages, it was very much that you know you shouldn't go 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 out unless you had to, and 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 medicine and allied health were put to one side. No, it is important for you to be in. So um, I cannot envisage um, being online again. But goodness knows, who knows with the pandemic, I suppose. So I'll put that tiny caveat in, but it's not our intention and very much the university and the medical schools council that sort of help support uh, the medical schools feel like it doesn't matter if you're in year one or year four, um, you know, you should be on sites learning. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, OK, so thinking about um, the course back again, we've got a few more things coming in. So Prince, I wonder if you could talk about for teaching and lectures is the learning alongside the whole cohort or are you smith uh, or are you split into smaller classes um okay so i hope i understood the question correctly um for the lectures um they are it is the same lecture transmitted across both campuses but obviously after the lecture we have group work and we're put into groups of around seven to ten and at crew at least these two groups per class and we usually have clinical educators coming around um just helping us out with any questions uh, that we need and if the lecture has been delivered from crew the lecturer can also come down and you know help us out with um, any clarifications that we might have from the lecture so yeah um to answer the question it is smaller groups um and at least in crew is two groups so at least 16 people in our class and I think that's really good because we get um each of us feels heard you know our whenever we have questions the clinical educator can actually come to us personally and um give us any clarification if we might need it thank you anything to add Andy I, I mean I, I was just trying to decide what, what what I should and shouldn't say I, I think our intention is that uh, as time goes on and you know cases are still fairly high well I say fairly as high as they've ever been in the UK at the moment although hospital admissions for COVID are, are much lower. We're still mindful of COVID existing. And so we, our intention is to slowly return to the lecture theatre, um, because I think, you know, most students feel that being in a lecture theatre is part of having a kind of higher education experience. I don't think it will be as clear as, ever, you know, Prince talked about the sort of sandwich, I always say, of sort of lecture, small group learning lecture, you know, that's your unit of teaching of a day. I, I suspect we won't ever go back to having two lectures in the lecture theatre every day, because I don't think actually that's the best way of learning. We find that a lot of what we've been doing via the streaming works really, really well, uh, and it gets you into those small groups. So it'll be a balance of everything. Um, uh, so, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've got any, much else to say about that, apart from we're reviewing what we think is most effective after a pandemic um, when we get there. So I'd like to move on 
to assessments. There's lots of different questions coming in. So I'm trying to cherry pick ones that that, that cross across across the other themes. Um, so how is medicine assessed? Is it synoptic or is it um, individual units? Uh, no, it's it is uh, it, well at Buckingham. <laughs> So how is medicine assessed? Uh, so it's synoptic. So although you have the discrete units that you will uh, you know, do, say Prince is doing molecules, genes, disease on, on a Tuesday, or, uh, and, you know, I don't know, tissues of the body on a Thursday, you, you, you learn them in sort of discrete units through the year. But every term, we have what we call an end of term assessment. And that can cover not only anything that's been uh, really, you should be answering this, Joe. But anyway, it could, um, it, anything that's been covered in that term, but also as we go on, we have what's called a spiral curriculum. So we revisit lots of things and build on lots of things that, that have already been, you know, something you did in term one might be revisited in term six. So actually, anything could be asked in those end of terms assessments that you've learned throughout your your course uh, and so that the idea is to try and continue to build on the foundations that you had um so so that's a long-winded way of saying it's not modular assessment i suppose no, I, yeah i would have said exactly the same Andy. so i don't need to answer that question um so i'd like to dip into some pre-med questions that are coming up if katia's um available i can't see you but i think you're in the background somewhere um Hi, Katya. So you're behind my question and answer. Sorry. Um, so what percentage of pupils are accepted into the pre-med course? Um, I wouldn't want to say a percentage is more. Uh, do you have the prerequisites? So if um, so, clearly, if you come to us, something hasn't gone quite right. So you haven't got the grades for medicine. Um, so far, everybody who does have the grade for pre-med will get in. You uh, these these grades are reviewed. Um, annually, uh, and it will be communicated to you. So, so if you have chemistry and biology, or uh, SA levels, you will most certainly get in if the grade is okay. If it isn't, and you are not, um, you haven't passed one or the other, you will be offered a foundation year, which I haven't talked about. Again, that's a nine months before pre-med. So you can do the foundation first, then pre-med, and then enter medical school again, providing you achieve 70%. Thanks, Katia. So during the nine month, is there any breaks in the pre-med program? Um, there are breaks at, uh, there's a short break at Easter. Our students are currently on that break. Um, so that's two weeks. Then there's a two week uh, break at uh, Christmas. Christmas doesn't apply to pre-meds because we study from no, it does. They study from January to July. So the break at Christmas and a break at Easter. And then of course, um, there's a short, it's a short week or so break in May. And other than that, we have a reading week at some point, but that's not strictly a break. It is a break from teaching, but not a break from studying and learning. Okay. So I'm going to move on to MMIs, which cut across both courses, um, because you need to sit an MMI to get into either pre-med um, or um, into medicine um, and I probably if it gets pushed back to me that's fine um, but could you tell us um, what an MMI is anybody <laughs> I, I don't mind having a crack at that so, so um, back when I was uh, trying to get into medical school uh, you would have uh, if you were having an interview sat in front of maybe a panel of four people and maybe interviewed for 20 minutes uh, and that panel would have then decided whether you were, uh, you know, fit to get into their medical school. And over the last sort of 10, 15 years, that, that's been frowned upon more and more because it's not a really effective way of, of knowing what you're like as a person. You know, it's a 20 minute snapshot. Um, and I'm sure Prince will be able to tell you about the experience, but our, our, the idea is that you do multiple stations uh, that are short, multiple mini, uh, and they will cover various topics uh, that we think are important to the qualities of a person that, you know, can enter medicine. So um, this is not you having to brush up on lots of knowledge. It's about your skills and your attitudes. And so a lot of it is about uh, explaining 
what you would do in a certain situation, perhaps your passion for the subject, but in very, very short bursts with lots of people meeting you. So we get a better, fairer impression of, of you as a person. And I don't know whether Prince wants to come in and, and say what that experience is like, because I, I, you know, apart from assessing on it, I've never had that experience. Yeah, um, so the MMI is the multiple mini interviews. They are um, around eight minutes long for each section, I think. And I think the biggest thing that I want to say that um, many other of my colleagues would agree with me on is that if perhaps you might mess up on one station, then you have a small break between you know each station and the next. So you can calm down uh, and basically prepare yourself for the next station, knowing that it's going to be, um, I wouldn't say completely different, but it's going to be a, a different situation than what you were faced with in the first um, station. And I think that just gives you, um, you know, a space of mind or just it lets you relax and know that even though you've done um, poorly, for lack of a better word, in one station, you're able to come back and make up for it in a different station. So I think I really enjoyed the, the MMIs. It was my first MMI. And, um, compared to other interviews that I've done, um, I just felt like I had, you know, I was more relaxed. It, it wasn't so fast paced where I'd have to keep um, so much information in my mind. Um, and with the breaks in between each station, I just had to be able, I was able to calm down and just prep myself up for the next station. Thank you, Prince. So yeah, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Katya. Yeah, so for, for the uh, MMIs really, um, as Andy mentioned, it, it's not really about your already existing skills. That what we that's what we are for. It's more about do you have the right sort of attitudes uh, and personality? Really, we check: uh, Are you able to work in a team? Do you have leadership qualities? Perseverance, compassion, ethical approach, um, problem solving. These are the sort of things that we are after. They're, they're not really something you could easily study for. We just want to know. Are you the right sort of person? Are you doing this for the right sort of reasons? This is not an academic assessment. Absolutely. Um, so there are several webinars that we run throughout the year about preparing for an MMI. So if you are in that situation where you get offered an interview, please do join them and we can help talk you through it. Probably don't have enough time here to go through everything. Um, but our MMI process, uh, as somebody's picked up on here, um, is a two-stage process um, and we run um, first stage interviews um, every other month so there's lots of opportunities um, and so there will be opportunities around clearing and I think there was a question about um, are there any in July and August and there will be some in July and August please speak to our admissions team if that's when you're particularly looking um, to have the MMI but if they do the pre-med course um, Katia do they have to redo the MMI um, to get into medicine no that is actually new now we don't have to redo them. We used to have to redo them, but not any longer. That has been changed. Um, there will be one MMI. Um, the entry point for uh, pre-med is lower than medicine. But then, of course, you do your pre-med and are then deemed um, ready for the medical school if you pass at the right grade. Perfect. Um, so, Andy, this might be an unfair question that I should probably answer, but do you know how many offers um, there are for medicine? Uh, do you know, Joe? I am going to push that back to you. How <laughs> I'm cruel. trying really hard not to take over. Um, no, it's okay. but that no, is my you should word. answer that rather than me saying a wildly inaccurate answer. So we roughly have about um, 12 applications for every place um, in medicine. Um, we interview. Um, we offer to interview. Not everybody accepts that that offer, but we offer to interview about 40% um, of those that put in an application, um, and then from the interview process, it's a, it's about one in two, one in three people um, that accept. So it gets down um, quite quite quickly. The odds are in your favor as you pass through um, the various steps. So hopefully that provides you a bit of an idea of how we rationalize those numbers of applications that come through. Okay, so um, I'm looking now, um, how, do you, how do we judge whether a person is right for pre-med or medicine? Do you, you, I mean, obviously the MMI process that we've been talking about here, um, but we look at um, the attributes that are mapped to things like good medical practice, which is a GMC document, which I hope 
you would go and have a look at, but also the NHS constitution. So it is, we are training people to be UK doctors. So we try and embed those UK values that exist in variety of different healthcare models. Um, okay, so just Jay, electives. On, on top of that, Joe, sorry. Well, what we also do is we get a panel of experienced assessors then yeah. to look at the questions that we pose and decide what would a reasonable candidate for medicine, pre-meds, whatever we're testing, answer and what, what scores would we expect them to get on each station. So, so it, it, it's, it's fairly, fairly meticulously quality controlled uh, at various stages. Absolutely. Um, so there were a few questions that have popped up um, going on a slightly different thread now about the medicine course. Um, and I know that I said in an earlier session that I'd pick this up if you put it in the chat. So thank you very much for reminding me. Um, how is the, what is the elective and how is it integrated into the course? Shall I answer that? Yes, please. So I think I, think I always want to start very basically about this because uh, the word elective means different things in different uh, um, countries. So what we term an elective in the UK is a, a space of time, often very close to uh, the end of a final year, where a student would go and study separately from the university. Um, and I think some people have already asked Jay this morning, you know, is, is there an obligation to go internationally or stay at home? But the vast majority of people on a UK elective go abroad for a different experience outside the NHS. But as with other UK universities, this is a self-funded seven-week placement. Um, the, there is less opportunity to go to stay home, as it were, in the UK, um, because uh, placements are tight across the uh, across the country. So there's not a, a sort of plethora of electives on uh, in the UK, but there are some. So understandably, some people can't or don't want to 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 go abroad. Some people really gra you know want to grasp that opportunity to see what a different kind of uh, you know healthcare system is like. Um, so ours, our elective, sits um, right at the end of of, of our, our four and a half year course. Um, just sitting with the apprenticeship. So it's actually after fin finals have, have happened. Uh, and it's, as I say, seven weeks roughly. There's a little bit of think of holiday time. You can extend it slightly, um, but we're, we're roughly looking at that time. Most people go off and do one placement. It's very hard to do two effective placements in seven, uh, in seven weeks, but, but you know those things can be discussed. Um, so it, it, it's, it's integrated in that it is within the course, but actually, you, you finished your exams, it's about how you can sort of thrive uh, and, and, you know, you have as much knowledge, skills and, and attributes then to, to go and see what it's really like somewhere. Hopefully that's picked up on what we touched on earlier and um, the question that was in the chat, there were a couple of questions in the chat about electives, but please do come back. Joe, I was going to say one more thing because I yeah. laboured the point about what an elective means in the UK, because in other countries, an elective means what we would call a student selected component. Okay. And a student selected component, you stay within the university or within your, your you know, the partner trust uh, confines to do some uh, work that might have a bit more academic leaning, you know, you might develop a poster, you might uh, do some presentations, you might write a paper um, on topics that interest you. Now, it's not it's not a free for all. We have a list of of SSCs often and uh, that you can kind of join and you have one in phase one and one in phase two. I won't go through the, the huge detail of that because they run differently. But that there's there's two things, the SSC, which is sort of in house, as it were, and the elective where it's much you know outside of the university. That's fair. Um, so I'm going to ask a question now that is definitely for Andy because it's a tricky one. So why is Buckingham ranked 35th in the medical school rankings? That is a, that is a tough question. So uh, it, it, it very much depends on which rankings you're looking at. Um, but the, the answer to that question is that the way that universities and medical schools are ranked uh, is not all equal. So there are lots and lots of things that the university doesn't enter into 
um, that are scored extremely highly on those rankings. So I used to be uh, a member before I was at the University of Buckingham. I, I taught at Imperial College. Now I'm not very much enjoyed teaching there. I thought it was a good course, but actually the reason why Imperial College is so high in the rankings is it's a research rich uh, institution that is linked to the medical school. So a lot of work as lots of people understand with the pandemic has been going on at Imperial College. Does that affect you as an undergraduate student? To be honest, I don't think most of our undergraduate students knew that there was any, any research going on at the institution. Whereas Bucking, we concentrate on medical education. So there is only a very, very small arm of the university that is doing any active clinical research. There is some that you can get involved in, but it's not at the size of your Oxford, your Cambridge, your Imperials. And because of that, that is discounted in our rankings. So, so we already will be sitting much lower than, than, than the average university that already has those kinds of research institutions. Um, yeah, and I, I, the, the other things would be to say that there are lots of uh, other rankings where we do very well in student support, uh, in our staff student teacher ratios. It depends on what you think is important. And I think if you think, well, I really, really want to be a clinician scientist and I've don't think that I'm going to do a lot of work outside of the lab. I'm going to, you know, uh, you know, concentrate on that. Then perhaps we're not the best university to support you in that. We can, but we we might not be as well equipped. But in terms of medical education, in terms of the uh, contact that you have with with staff, um, we we are, I think, excel compared to a lot of the other universities. I noticed that our, de our dean has come on and would probably like to follow up on that one. Joe, Can I add something to that? Hello, everybody. I'm coming in late here. I'm Joe Harris. I'm the dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So absolutely agree with everything Andy said about the rankings. And it just goes to show you actually need to dig beneath the surface of the rankings. And we were very irritated when we saw these. Now, rankings, one of the things in the rankings is the um, employability or the number of people in employment. Of, from a medical school. Well, clearly, 100% of people who graduate in medicine go into work. That, that's pretty much a, a given. But the data they use for the rankings is two or three years out of date. So when they were producing the rankings, we hadn't yet graduated medical students that had joined the workforce. And so our grad, graduate employment was 0%, which um, we found really irritating and we did complain to the people who were compiling the rankings, but there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. So I think just look in future years and watch us rise up the rankings would be my, my thought on that. Thank you, Joe. Um, so we have a bit of time left, so I'm going to try and whiz through some of the other questions that have been coming in as, as we've been talking. Um, so this one for Prince, I think, um, medicine's four and a half years. Are there less breaks? Do we get the same amount of breaks as other medical schools? And do we get any breaks at all? Prince. Okay, so um, obviously uh, we have a, an intake of January. So we start at a very different time compared to almost all other universities um, of medicine in the UK. So, and the course is actually, I think, uh, the shortest course in the UK for medicine, whereas some universities would have uh, five years and then some would also have six, including our foundation. At the University of Buckingham, it's a 4.5 uh, year course. So I think with that, they expect it to be um, more compressed. Um, that's to say that we don't get as many breaks as other universities um, usually provide. So uh, like summer, we don't have that. We're usually studying, but we do get a fair amount of breaks. I think next week we have an Easter holiday and the for Christmas with a, a short Christmas holiday just after our end of term end of term um, assessment we had a holiday as well and I think I like the fact that I mean personally anyway I like the fact that there's not that many holidays um, because sometimes holidays get a bit too long and I have way too much free time and you know some of the mem um, the content that I've learned if I'm not keeping up my work, it just, you know, um, it leaves. So the fact that we don't get as many breaks um, is good. And I think it's also to be expected with the course being as uh, short as it is, because one of the reasons why I picked uh, the university was the fact that it was a shorter course, because I want to finish um, the degree and then, you know, jump into my career as, as soon as I can. 
think that's yeah, a very thorough um, explanation. Andy, do you want to follow up on anything? Only that, uh, you know, we get a lot of that, actually. I'm always surprised at how our students say, I'm glad that the holidays aren't extremely long. And I, I think it's worth saying, you know, it's sort of eight to 10 weeks a year of holiday, depending on what you count. You know, Katia mentioned about things like reading weeks, there's revision weeks, there's lots of weeks when there aren't, there isn't teaching occurring. But, but yes, the holidays are shorter, but it tends to mean that our students come back refreshed enough, but they haven't forgotten everything that they learned having had three and a half months off. So, um, you know, we get a lot of that. We get a lot of people actually saying they prefer it, which, uh, you know, I'm constantly surprised by, but very reassured. Okay, so there is a lot of MMI questions coming in. So I might just fire off some of those questions and answers very quickly. Um, so how many uh, medicine interviews have um, occurred so far? We've had two of our first stages. Is that right? No, one of our first stages and one next week, <laughs> sometime one in April, um, which is mostly full. There may be a few spaces available. So please do check with our admissions team. Um, and we've got them every other month moving forward. Um, so there are still spaces available for a January 23 start. Please do get your applications in quickly. Um, and then you have the most opportunity um, because spaces do fill up um, and there will be limited space towards the end of the year. When do we hear back from the MMI process? We aim to get answers back after the MMI within two weeks, sometimes quicker, but we give that two week window um, to make sure that we're doing all the quality control and things that we need. Um, how do we judge applicants um, by MMIs to make UK doctors? Do we not bias international students who don't have a UK mentality? So um, I think that's a, re it's a really good point. It picked up on something that I, I was talking about, that we are graduating people to go into the UK environment, um, but we are selecting people who have those underlying human attributes that are international. And we make sure at every opportunity when we're creating these selection um, scenarios and tasks um, that we look for any cultural bias that might um, impact people that are not from a UK um, setting. So the skills that you need to be a doctor are the same worldwide. You need those um, values and attributes um, that are related to being able to be patient-centered, to have the empathy, respect, uh, communication skills. Um, it's just we make sure we don't ask those in a in a culturally specific way and I'm sure I think Andy wants to come well, in I'm, I'm just going to give an example I suppose of where that might slightly differ so you know within within the NHS we have a real emphasis on team working the doctor is part of the team uh, and helps to bring together some of the complexity and and managing that um, and works with a, a you know huge amount of professionals some other uh uh, countries wouldn't put so much emphasis on how a doctor works within the team so so in order for us to mirror that when you go through MMI we need to know have you have you got the the um, ability to grow as someone who would work well in a team so so there are some things that might not be universal but shouldn't be affected culturally that we look at when we're designing our MMIs yeah that's fair um, okay, so other questions, just so many that have been passed, I'm just picking up. Um, the last admissions offer um, to students, so we're, we anticipate we're going to be open until after clearing this year, but as we've said before, we do fill up our places. Um, so the earlier you can get your application in, and even if you've only got predicted grades at this point, we can move forward with predicted grades. So we would highly recommend you get an application in early in the cycle and not leave it. You can apply directly. You don't have to apply via UCAS. So you can talk to our admissions team and make an application outside of the UCAS system. So please do talk to us um, and move forward quickly with that process if possible um okay um rankings after the mmi is there still a chance um yeah i mean candidates are waitlisted we do have a reserve list um after um an mmi because you know we do have multiple events throughout the year and we want to make sure that we give those later in the year an opportunity especially if they're really really good candidates at the end of the year but that doesn't mean it's an absolute no if it was an absolute no we would tell you it was an absolute no so a reserve list is there um 
for us to make sure that we can fill up our spaces, but also to let you know um, that there may be a space available in the future. So being as transparent as we can be about it, um, we'd like to fill all of our spaces. We know people want to come to us. So we're just saying this is the process for, for the maybe pile. Um, okay, um, how, do you, how much notice do you get between stages? Um, roughly around two to two weeks. Um, and you'll be invited again, but you can come back to a later date if you can't make it. We have systems in place for you to book in for the second stage. So again, it, there's lots of opportunities to be flexible and have an individualized journey. Um, okay. Um, right, I think I've picked up all the MMI stuff now. Um, does the University of Buckingham have any international connections with other universities and hospitals? Do you want to pick that up, Andy? Sorry, I was just reading one of the questions. Sorry, say, say that again, Joe. Do we have any international connections with universities or hospitals? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you're going to have to help me out, Joe. If I'm, I'm trying to think if we do. So, I mean, we have collaborations with other institutions, yeah. but as part of the course, all of our providers have to be within our GMC framework and quality assured. So the course itself, apart from the electives maybe, um, are all within the UK, but we do have connections. Um, connections come in lots of different ways and they could be research collaborations, um, especially through our postgraduate work and our labs. Um, and we have close links and on a professional basis with other institutions. Yeah, well, well answered. Thanks. Um, okay, um, I'm going down the bottom because I haven't seen any come in. Um, Whilst you're looking, I, I just want to clarify what I was saying about multidisciplinary team working. Okay. In no way was I saying that it, only in the UK do we work within a team. What I'm saying is there are certain countries, and I know this because I have worked outside of the NHS, there are certain countries that, that value the multidisciplinary team less. So it might be that there are other places that team working wouldn't be an attribute that would be in the top five for working as a doctor. That was my point, not that only in the UK do we think that's an attribute. So scholarships, are there any scholarships available, particularly if you've done exceptionally well in a particular year of study, Andy? I mean, it's something we certainly are, are, are always looking to, to provide. That it, it, It's sporadic and it depends on uh, where we are in the year and what we've had in terms of donations. So. Um, at the moment, if you were relying on a scholarship, I think it's it's worth speaking to us at the admissions team and seeing what's available at the time. Um, we we do have uh, you know benefactors that come in, and so, so sometimes they will be specific and say, you know, I'd want this money to go to scholarships. Other times they want to donate so we can improve our our resources and our buildings. So um, it's we don't have anything that I can immediately signpost you to that's there on a regular basis, but there may be. So if that's something that you're thinking about or it's something you think you need, you, you probably just need to speak to the admissions team at the time. So Katia, a question about the pre-med course. What time of year will exams be held for pre-med? Um, our current pre-meds are as I said, on holiday, they, after the holidays, have another month and a bit. Um, we begin the exams beginning of June. So they're already finishing their coursework portfolio and their um, synoptic exams are at the beginning of June. We then have the exam board uh, July. That's why I say the course ends in July, because that's when the students will hear what their grade is and whether they're off to medical school. Thank you. Um, I'm suddenly aware that we are running over time. So I want to end with one question that I've been saving because <laughs> um, I think it's a really good place to, to end the, the session um, and give all of our panelists an opportunity um, to feedback before we close. So before starting our medicine journey, if you have a lot of free time, what would you recommend to do to aid you when starting medical school? Um, what topics and resources would you advise that our students look at. I'm going to start with uh, Prince. <sighs> okay, um, I think that's a tricky question. Um, so I'm going to look at this question as if I was, um, as if I myself was asking before I joined. Um, I would say, not necessarily take it easy, but you know, 
make the most of uh, of your time that you have before you actually join med school because everyone knows that it is uh, quite tedious. Obviously, that's not to say that just completely waste your time doing nothing. Um, there are resources provided um, by the university. Um, the workbooks, once you get an offer, I think it's a few weeks uh, before the course starts, so you can look at those. Um, but in general, maybe going through uh, some of the, the notes that you had, um, if you're a high school leaver or if you've done a, re a relevant uh, biomedical course, just running through those uh, slightly, just so you know you can keep your mind um, fresh. And when you join, it's not a complete uh, jump into you know, learning out of nowhere after a, a big or long period of not studying. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say. Sorry, I put myself on mute. Thank you, friends. Uh, Katia, do you have any advice? Um, I would not as such prepare specifically. What would be useful is perhaps cast a glance over your chemistry and biology notes from A-levels. Um, that's the sort of thing that students otherwise can struggle with. Um, and if you don't have an awful lot of time, pick the weaker of the subjects. Just have a quick read of, of uh, the concepts. Um, the rest will we'll do once you're here. Absolutely. So Andy, you get the last word. I, I agree with what both Prince and Katia have said. I, I never, Joe's heard me answer this question many times before, and I never like being too specific. But if I were to talk about subjects, I suppose cell biology, um, some very basic chemistry, um, and so actually, I often say math, so that we, you know, in year one, we do a lot of medical statistics and lots of people, you know, it's very basic, but lots of people will feel very allergic to, to statistics. So if you can do some very basic, uh, you know, thinking around the things that you might have done at GCSE or if you've never done A-level math, you know, really tiny bit of brushing up on probability and things. But, it, it, you know, I agree with what Katia said we are not expecting you to spend the entirety of your time preparing. If you've met the criteria that we expect, then you will be taught the rest of what's necessary. So I would much rather that you got out into your local community and you learned about what it is to serve your community. Because if you're going to be a doctor, um, of course, the basic science, of course, all the clinical stuff that we teach you is important, but the real, bottom line is you're there to be accountable to the community you serve so it might be volunteer work it might be going out and just you know experiencing you know great if you're able to travel you know learn what it is to 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 relate to human beings more because actually the the worst doctors are not the people that fail because they didn't know enough of their a-level biology and chemistry it's because that they struggle to relate to people and so I would spend, you know, however long you have trying to do that better. Thank you very much. My, my only addition to that is to maybe have a look at some of the GMC documents, um, like good medical practice. But yes, fundamentally, everything that you need to know, we will be teaching you. Um, so use your time for something aligned, but outside of medicine. So... Thank you very much. I am going to call um, this webinar to a close. Um, I don't want to run over any further um, and impede any future sessions. Um, again, please do join other sessions if you're thinking about pre-med um, and BSc, not sure if the direct medicine route is for you, um, please do, do join that session and join our allied health session if you're not sure about which healthcare profession um, you're interested in. We have a range of different other options which are, which are patient facing um, and may be an appropriate choice for you in your journey through higher education. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day and please do contact our admissions team with any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye.